Well, I want to start today by making what I think is a fairly obvious statement, but for some might be considered a provocative statement. Law actually just is engineering. Now, it's a particular type of engineering implemented in a particular manner. And the question that I want to pose to you today is the, to what extent, since law is engineering, could it, the field benefit from traditional academic fields where engineering is the centerpiece, traditional STEM fields, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. So for the benefit of our audience, and no, not, you know, people come with different backgrounds, uh, uh, our multidisciplinary audience, I want to just start with the broadest possible question, which is why do we even have law and legal institutions in the first place? What is the purpose that they serve? Well, societies try to create rules to govern different types of social, economic, and political behavior, and societies create institutions, governance institutions that are designed to, to solve different types of legal tasks. These include creating rules, interpreting rules, vis-a-vis in, in, uh, -vis various circumstances that, are, that pro, uh, pose themselves, and then enforcing those rules uh, um, uh, in, in various applications. Now, of course, because this involves people, this is not a completely neutral process. This is not just a mechanistic application of rules to circumstances. Uh, and things involving humans are, are messy. And, uh, um, and of course, uh, rules themselves are not the only things that govern behavior, uh, uh, top-down governmental rules, so, you know, social norms and other types of, uh, um, of, of, of underlying mechanisms help engineer different types of behavior we observe, the behavior we observe in a society, and, and to help prevent and minimize other forms of bad behavior. Even in the absence of legal rules, organizations and societies will operate to some degree of effectiveness, but rules do help us kind of govern and, and order society. So I hope you can see that is actually an engineering challenge. It's a grand engineering challenge. We posit the rules, we hope to get the behavior, and the question is, is you know, when we look out is, does this rule get us the behavior or not? Uh, how would we know that? And that, you know, there are tools that exist to help us with that. So I hope you can see it's also a challenge that is way beyond the traditional field of law. The traditional field of law is pretty impoverished when it comes to answering types of questions like that, merely using kind of uh, the mechanisms we tra traditionally see today. Uh, so I think for, again, these STEM fields give us a toolkit that can help us in a collaborative manner uh, of, you know, better evaluate and make the law improve, get better over time. So by way of introduction, I am an academic. I teach at uh, the Illinois Institute of Technology. Uh, I'm also affiliated faculty at Stanford Codex. And in this context, uh, I do scientific applications or scientific, though studying the law as if it were a science, because it can be. And, uh, you know, I publish, do things that academics do. Maybe not write law reviews all day, but do other things like scientific things that are related to the field of law. And I'm, I work here uh, um, at the Center for Techno uh, Legal Technology and Data Science at Viserys Law School as, as kind of one of, uh, one of the hats that I wear. And uh, back at my home institution, I also help run a polytechnic center called the Law Lab. And I, I've taught at various schools around the world, uh, University of Toronto, Singapore Management University, IE in Madrid, and uh, here at Viserys. I'm also out in the space uh, as a thought leader. You know, uh, uh, this is from, you know, before, before COVID and hopefully after COVID. I've spent time as a, um, in the innovation space as an uh, advisor and have served as a, worked as a consultant and had a successful exit uh, from my company, LexPredict. Um, and I only mention that because I want to orient some of my commentary to you today. Uh, I am not a spectator in what I'm going to talk about here today. I'm a participant in what I'm going to actually talk about today. So uh, these are going to be my notes from the field. So first, the con complexity challenge. You know, whether you're a big company, uh, uh, a small business, or a individual citizen, the field of law has a complexity challenge. You ask a big organization, uh, uh, you know, what are the rules that we're supposed to fo follow? They have large numbers of individuals and, and processes devoted to trying to comply with, uh, with legal rules. Individuals have uh, serious challenges complying with legal rules, not even knowing what those rules are, seeing a lot of complexity, so forth and so on. And if you take a step back, you know, what is it that really drives demand for, you know, if you're an economist, you'd call it units of legal production. 
That's what lawyers do. They produce units of legal production. Legal systems produce units of legal production. If you're an economist, this is what you would say. What is it that causes demand for law, law or, or units of law to be produced? Complexity is one of the big drivers. If the systems were simple, it'd all be straightforward. You know, we wouldn't need as many lawyers, we wouldn't need as many systems, it'd be very straightforward, but it is not. Ergo, you know, we get more social, economic, and political complexity, and that manifests in our domain as legal complexity. So while it's somewhat difficult to precisely define, I've spent a lot of my time working on this task of defining a thing that a lot of people would accept. You won't have to really argue with them that there's legal complexity, but then you say, well, how would you measure and define it? That's where it kind of gets challenging. People say, I don't know. Uh, um, it's just really complex. Take my word for it. Uh, and so this is kind of, again, that's uh, with your scientist hat on, that's a, an opportunity for, for us to actually try to fill that in. And like any effort, no particular measure might be perfectly characteristic, but you, the more of these, you get a kind of composite as you kind of cut it in a bunch of different ways. So virtually every way you cut legal complexity, it has grown. Grown and grown and grown and grown. And I'll talk a little bit about this in a second. But we see significant growth in law and regulations as a function of time. So this is uh, U.S. and Germany, two large industrialized countries, but I think these patterns would hold ac across other large in industrialized countries. So we have like two times the number of regulations we had 25 years ago and 50% more statutes than we had 25 years ago. So there's more, le more legal rules to work with. And um, the, the, the thing is, if you're, if you're the receiver of that, you don't really get to control the number of those things. You have to respond to what you have, what what you're given. And so to me, the question is, how do you match that growing complexity with the appropriate kind of mitigation tactics? Uh, uh, you know, the law might get more complex, but if you can solve for the complexity problem, then you can, you can kind of manage your affairs. So what we see in the legal tech space, I mean, the sort of demand for technology is we, 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 need, we need mixtures of people, process, and technology to have product, better, greater productivity. You just have more stuff that has to get done and you can't just throw people at every problem. So designing more scalable systems, because again, the legacy model in this space is every time you see complexity, just throw more people at the problem. But that problem is that doesn't scale very well. It just does not scale to the number. So if you're a big company, you say, we're spending way too much money on, on law. We're here to actually make something and do something, not spend money to, to, to pay lawyers and compliance, uh, compliance folks and so forth. And you know, we need to get, we have more stuff to do in a fixed budget. How do we get that done? Usually what we see in most economic stories is people build tools to, to get greater productivity. It's one of the oldest economic stories there ever was. Um, so I, my view is that the idea that we're just going to have more and more people for every one of these tasks as complexity is ramping up, that has hit its kind of practical and economic limits. So the approach to me needs to be more fundamental and leverage the best of science and technology. And so I have thoughts on this, you know, about what some of these complexity mitigation tactics might look like. Um, but um, let me just say, so one thing when we talk about, well, how would you build tools? How would you build tools for these types of problems? Well, what we often have is you have to create some representation of the system, of the problem. And that takes you into the world of modeling. And I want to say there's six types of models, at least six. Um, that's what a scientist and engineer does. They create a model of something. Now, models of various f flavors are quite common in science and engineering. Um, you know, I want to discuss a series of ideas associated with the modeling of legal systems. You can do this in at least six ways. So what is modeling, by the way? The term takes a variety of different meanings across the sciences. Here are some elements. A model is a representation of a system. It likely involves some degree of abstraction of the system. It be can be used to both understand system components and their connection to one another. And there's various approaches you can use. That's a famous quote. All models are wrong and some are useful. Oh, that's an old quote. Had to be said. So there's at least six of these that I think are relevant for modeling legal systems. And let's remember, each of these has an accompanying mental model. We have models of how systems work in our minds. There are, the model already exists. It's just a question of whether you write it down or you store it here. But it's already there. You have a model of all of, you have models for all types of things in your mind. That's how you operate every day. If you didn't have a model, you wouldn't be, you, know, you have data and a model and a representation of how things work. It's up here, stored. So I want to start and look at that at different scales. Micro, meso would be kind of intermediate level, and then at the macro level. 
So the first thing you might do, I sort of previewed it already, is you might model the law itself at the aggregate level. You might look at the law as a, as a representation, one way to represent things. So I've already given you a preview of this. You could take the actual rules themselves and model them, both at a moment in time, and you could do it over time, because you can learn stuff. Well, what's, are things growing? Are they getting smaller? You can, you can do that scientifically. So you can take something like a group of statutes, and you can model them. Here, this, uh, <clears throat> here, this should be uh, somewhat, somewhat familiar. Um, you can see three things here. You see a hierarchy, a reference network, so one part of the law references another, and a sequence graph, and words, lots of words. So here's some examples. People have started to work on modeling legal systems like this. This is from France. This is a French example, Hungary at the European Union level. Um, I've done work in the, in the US context going back a long time ago. Um, let me just give you, you know, we looked at a single shot, snapshot in 2010, but just to kind of show you this, what this looks like. This is one part of the United States code. This is a nonprofit organization, is a 501c3 exempt organization, which actually means go to Title 26, then to A, then to 1, then to F, then to 1, then to 501, then to C, then to 3. Big radial layout, if, as, as you see it here. But actually, there's references within that hierarchy to other parts of the law. So to understand the part you're reading, you have to go read other parts. And this is the citation network of the US code. And so it's actually this combined with that gives you that. And that's just the federal law, not all the states, not all the judicial judgments, not all the regulations. So you get to see, get a picture for it, complexity. So here we, we looked at just a snapshot in 2010, but when you look at it over time, you get a little bit of a different story. So that's what we did here. Here we, we started with the US, we added Germany, and we said, let's look at it over 25 years. And then there's this question of, you know, how you might or how the laws are organized. I mean, people tend to organize it at a moment in time, but the world changes, and they don't dynamically update the, the, the re what's related to what. So you see, you know, you see famous references like discussions of microcomputers. You'll see that in parts of the law. Microcomputer was a was a to com contrast it with the computers at the size of a, like a you know an enormous room or something like this. So they, just kind of one of many examples of the rule, the discussion, and the things that matter at a time and a mo you know moment in time. It changes as a function of time. So one of the things we work on is how would you algorithmically sort of reorganize the law and try to l look at the flow of ideas. And so this is kind of a, a well-known approach to doing that, which I won't talk about today. That's like a a long form thing to go into, but one of the things you can do is you can kind of reorganize the law and you can trace how ideas flow into other ideas as a function of time. Again, once you kind of go down the path of the science, a lot of things are possible. Then we've added all the regulations. So um, certain areas of the law are heavily regulatorily, sort of that's where the law action actually is and the statutes are, are less important and vice versa. And we see that both countries. You know, a lot of things, a lot of um, notions we have about how the law works a lot of them are more anecdotal than you might realize. There haven't been these macro studies of the law uh, uh, too much in, the, in our field. And that's something you know, that you see, and again, we, this is the growth dynamic, though. That's pretty consistent. More laws, more rules, more regulations, different areas. You see different growth dynamics across different topics, topical areas, but... And then there's even larger scales. So all I've shown you is executive, the, the blue area, or sorry, the, the red area here, uh, you see f the federal legislative and executive, but all those other tiles aren't even been filled in here. And that just gives you a taste. So this involves modeling combinations of information theory, network science, and natural language processing, words, processing text. But there's other ways to model a legal system. One thing you could look at is, I don't know what happens in the system, let's look at how it performs. Look at the outputs of the system. So you know, how would you measure or evaluate the quality of a, of a legal system? That's a project many people have been working on in the academy. I think it's a good project. You know, how would you compare legal systems and their performance? That's a project people work on. It's a good project to work on. How would you know, how would an individual measure compare to the composite measure? It's these and other related questions which, you know, a lot of NGOs and researchers are regularly trying to answer. You know, how strong is the rule of law in this country, that country, this place, this part within, you know, these are the types of things. 
How, how well functioning is this judiciary versus that judiciary in this country or in that country? You know, it turns out these questions are not that easy to answer, to measure. Um, so there have been a lot of attempts to measure this idea of rule of law. Now, it's pretty clear when there's no rule of law, that's much easier. But in this, there's a big intermediate zone where it's harder to ter determine. Um, but a lot of things like funding from lar you know, large multinationals is a function of stuff like this. Or organizations are trying to pursue rule of law around the world. But they're trying to pursue a thing that it's actually kind of hard to measure. How would you know if you're getting successful or not at the task? Again, that's going to take you in the scientific direction. So we've got to measure it. We have, why would, do we give more money, less money? Are we being, is our money effectively doing anything? You know, these are reasonable questions. So we want to move from a I know it I, when I see it kind of world to kind of more objective or generalizable measures. Again, it's much easier said than done. So here's just a few examples of projects and papers on that subject. So this has been a big focus of the World Bank is to try to create you know, that, that lack of rule of law is an impediment to justice, or an impediment to development. And so solving this rule of law problem solves the development problem. That's their view, you know, and, but to actually make it happen is a much more difficult uh, sort of thing. But there have been attempts to measure how good is the governance in a given country, in a given part of a country, so forth and so on. Many, many projects on this task. Okay, here's another model, modeling approach. You might actually look at legal rules and evaluate their performance. You know, as a field, an intellectual field, you know, this, there's a dust up that happens in the academy every so often because there's kind of traditionalists and then there's like empiricists who want to measure things. Um, but the field has what they call a credibility revolution that happened where people, you know, you know, we have lawyers and judges and policymakers crafting legal rules and doctrines and then never, and critiquing rules and doctrines and then never actually going out and doing any empirical analysis if whether these critiques or changes to the rules actually get better performance in real life, which you'd think would be the fundamental. It'd be like if we had health policy where we just wrote essays back and forth to one another and then we made it, we set COVID policy based on that. It's just an essay contest, best essay wins, and then we're, that's it. Not... Let's measure if, these, if this thing is actually effective. We have no, we don't, you know, we didn't do, we don't do randomized control trials in this field until relatively recently, you know, or anything kind of akin to that. And so there's been a big focus on, on empiricism in law, and rightly so, because if, you got, if you're going to go, you know, try to engineer the world, you should actually measure, you're, they're engineering it either way. They're just, by what means you do the engineering, you should actually go and see if this, the, 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 the performance that you're seeking uh, out of these rules is actually happening in reality. So roughly about 25 years ago, there began to be an empirical turn in legal scholarship. And so you start seeing organizations and journals and a lot of schools you know, around the world getting focused on empiricism. But it's a very fundamental thing. Like, if we're going to change a legal rule, we want to know, does it actually lead to the, the behavior change in society that we're seeking? This, this doctrine, that doctrine, this rule, this rule. And so you start seeing this kind of um, many schools around the world. You know, the task is basically very simply, again, you want to see, does this policy intervention, this change in a rule, actually lead to the desired ends? It seems so basic, right? Again, in medicine, you would never do such a thing. It's just, you would go and say, does the patient get better or worse? It seemed like a pretty fundamental thing. So what you start see people try to do is then they start using tools from social sciences to do this type of measurement exercise. Um, and then... People say, well, you need to really control for cause and effect. There's better models in econometrics. And so people start doing that. And so these are the types of things you start seeing in, in academic journals within law are these types of things which you see more commonly in economics. Uh, but the, goal, the real task is to actually say in, whether we can lock down cause and effect where this change leads to that effect in reality. So the goal is to get something like an RCT or randomized control trial, but we don't get to like give half the people the sugar pill and half the people the real treatment in, po in most policy interventions, you can't do that. And so you're trying to use technical methods to re reproduce something like that. That's the goal. Um, so people try to get these synthetic versions of RCTs, but the goal is to link cause and effect, which is again, a very appropriate thing. That is also a model, another type of modeling technique you see in the field and a very appropriate one in my view. If you look on SSRN alone, there are like, almost 9,000, you know, pushing 9,000 papers that have been written, 
many of which written in the last 10 or 15 years of the, of the 9,000. Um, you know, here's just a few examples. So like, this is trying to see whether there was a change in the civil pleading rules. Does it lead to the desired outcomes of why the rules were changed in the first place? Or the bankruptcy rules get changed. Do we actually get better outcomes for debtors? Or, you know, what's the effect of, uh, uh, on outcomes of changes in the criminal, criminal law? Or whether this um, changes in the patent law doctrine actually lead to less patent trolls? Again, very basic, because people say they're doing it to prevent a thing, but does it actually happen in reality? And so you even see like textbooks about teaching people some degree of empiricism um, in the field. Okay, here's a fourth type of model. Fourth type of model, simulation-based analysis. Simulation, this is much less common in this field. You see it in other fields where people want to simulate. People like build simulations of markets and stuff like this because they want to say, well, you know, what intervention will actually lead to, you know, uh, successful market outcomes, and so forth and so on. But, you know, typically what happens is people do a policy change and then they try to measure whether that actually cause and effect, you know, you lead to the, to the desired outcomes or, or what have you. But often, or what you'd really love to do is actually say, well, let me not deploy it. Let me actually, t let me run a simulation and see, as, at least as a gut check to see if it actually has a chance of working. And if it doesn't, let's not deploy it and find out later that it didn't work. So sometimes a policymaker would like to kind of do that. Um, otherwise, you got to do the post hoc empirical analysis. But uh, um, so there's other methods to do that up front, on the upfront. So there's a variety of different ways to build these formal models. These are kind of three big buckets, a game theoretic model, an agent based model, or a model of systems dynamics. And you'll see kind of all three of those, especially if you go to the broader sciences, much less commonly would you see it in this field. Now, one thing to understand in these simulations is there's an uncanny valley in simulations. Like, if you have a hyper-stylized model, like, you know, Conway has the game of life. Now, nobody thinks that's a real model of the world, right? It's like very so stylized, no, but you can learn something from it because all models are wrong and some are useful, right? Now, if you go all the way into the super realistic, you're like in The Sims or something like this. But if you get anywhere in the in-between zone, People will crush you. They say, well, why does he have this? And why doesn't he have that? And what about this? And what about that? If you don't do the simulation, then you're already running a simulation. You run it up here. They clobber you because of some detail that's missing from the model. So here's a few papers on that. These are older game theoretic papers, but, you know, the... The Priest-Klein hypothesis is quite a famous paper in law and economics focused on, you know, this, how cases settle as a function of time and the dynamics over which civil cases in civil court work, it works with plea bargaining to some extent. Also, you know, how, how you get settlement as what are the game theoretic dynamics associated with that. Uh, and so there's, there's a number of papers that I just put in here uh, for your consideration, but um, this is a simulation model looking at you know, what, what is the impact of greater, you know, gr uh, tax compliance and evasion as a function of, of, of people's network and kind of greater or lesser interdiction by, by tax authorities. And this is a, a paper that's looking at kind of governance of common pool resources, like forests and uh, water and so forth, um, a simulation. And, and this is, uh, uh, um, Another one that's looking at you know, kind of criminal behavior and, and its relationship, uh, um, you know, to different types of deterrence strategies. And then this is a, a computerized system simulation model to support planning and court systems. So we have a backlogs problem uh, around the world in courts, some places more than others. You know, two, two well-known places are India and Brazil, where they have huge backlogs for very long periods of time. And so some of the question is, you know, if you were going to come in and try to re-engineer that, you'd try to focus on, well, I'd like to simulate what the effects of, uh, you know, because a lot of cases will settle, but only after a very long period of time. And then there's nobody, what happens is the judge's time is all blocked off and then they can't slide another thing in this space. And so a simulation model could be used to try to have more intelligent scheduling of cases. But you need some, some representation to do that. Okay, what's another model? 
modeling user experiences with the legal process. Now we're getting more micro, right all the way down to the individual. You know, law has many policy processes and procedures. In fact, we teach entire classes on legal processes and procedures. You know, that's a, it's a huge, a huge thrust of, uh, uh, of the of classical law training. Um, you know, there are other ways to characterize processes and procedures. And here's some relevant intellectual disciplines. Process engineering, operations research, design thinking, and human-computer interaction. These are fields where process is the centerpiece of, uh, uh, or at least a center, one of the centerpiece items in these fields. Um, and you know, if you're actually developing or deploying software, that's always based on a model. You say, well, if we're gonna, we used to do it in person, now we're gonna do it in a software system, then you have to represent somehow in the system a model of what the, f the system looks like out there if it's gonna be successful. So things like case management and matter management require a step-by-step -step understanding of a process. What's the beginning? Say the beginning of a dispute all the way through its life cycle and being able to step people through. The unsuccessful case management and matter management de deployments are ones where they didn't take the time to figure that out and then nobody uses them or people don't find them to be very effective. The other thing that happens when you map your processes, it's support, you can re-engineer those processes once you realize you know, uh, how they actually operate in reality. And it becomes the foundational data to support other types of modeling efforts. So there are well-known methodologies out there for managing projects, you know, process-centered work, from field of project management and process improvement. You know, and if you look at the whole economy, a lot of places people are trying to look at an artisanal process and turn it into an industrialized process, the, the industrialization of an artisan. And this is an old idea. This is not a new idea. This is an old idea. At least starts here. I mean, this is the documentation of the beginning of industrialization. It carries through here. But that's manufacturing physical objects. What about other types of objects? Well, what you see is people started beginning to borrow those ideas and bring them into white collar work away from manufacturing physical objects. And um, what you want to do is re-engineer and keep the things that actually add value but delete the things that do not. And this is something that um, you know, we use in legal project management and process improvement class at my, at my uh, home institution. That's a process as we think it is. That's the process as it actually is. If you documented what people, all the people are doing, that's the process as it should be from what's the stuff that actually creates value. As we think it is, as it actually is in reality, if you took the time to document it, and as it should be. So these are some of the methodologies that have been developed to work on these process kind of centric exercises, Lean, Six Sigma, and other, other related methodologies. And I think they can improve every subsector in law. And we have a lot of high volatility processes where there's a ton of stuff to do and not, nothing to do in peaks and valleys like this. And if you collect data and you have greater predictability, you can understand kind of, you don't get them flat completely, but you can lower the, the, the peak and valley sort of problem. So when you map uh, a process as it is, you get a useful artifact, which is a process map. That's a single process step. What tool was used? What document? How much time? Who's the role? What's the task? What's the billing code? What's the participant? That's really granular. You can roll it up from there to something much more grandiose. These are in people's minds already. Remember, there's always a mental model. Doing this can aid response times, margins, predicting resource loads, and coordinating across stakeholders. You know, I teach this full-length class at my, my school you know, together with this law firm called Cypher Shaw, um, uh, which is like a top 100 US law firm. Uh, and this has been, it's really interesting. This is teaching people to think like engineers, but about law. So as you can connect, collect data about processes, you, you can use rich or granular data to help illuminate the actual processes present in various organizations. And then you can use those to make predictions about cost and duration, because people always want to know how long is it going to take and how much is it going to cost. And you would too if you were the client or customer. Everybody wants to know that. They don't want. They don't want. And courts can also use this to scientifically schedule things like cases, so they don't have the peaks and valleys. And they, that's the way you solve the back. One of the ways you solve the backload problem. Linking and logging every unit of exercise to a process map. That's. That's what an engineer would do. Starts with this, 
gets reflected in a software system and, and over time, you know, now don't create a radiculogram. That's where you like say, first we, first we fold this, then we staple this, then we put it in an envelope. You know, you don't need that degree of granularity. You can go up all slightly up from there. Once you can make predictions about individual nodes, then you can do predictions about phases of matters. This whole matter will take this amount of time. This is the distribution of time over similar matters. This is the distribution of costs as a function of time. By the way, speaking of prediction, this is the sixth type of modeling. Predictive models of legal systems. How long will this matter take? How much will it cost? Will we win? What are the right resources to use at the matter and task level? These are all predictions, folks. These are all predictions. And people are making predictions every single day. Now, as I've said, there's two kind of candidates for major candidates for processing predictions. You can use a machine, this computer, or this computer. That's it. Those are the computers we have available. One is computer science, the other is cognitive science. Now, I expand on this over here, but um, I think computational prediction um, will lead to kind of two particular, particular families of methods. They take you, takes you to these two fields, machine learning and natural language processing. These modeling methods um, can be used, can be leveraged in cases such as the following. Linking contract terms and outcomes, predicting rogue behavior, finding relevant legal information, predicting costs, duration, case outcomes, scheduling, judge work allocation. It can be used all over our field. Now, from a global perspective, there's been significant scientific and commercial interest in leveraging and building these types of models. So around the world, people have tried to build prediction models for judges, finding relevant documents, predicting costs. This is what I said in the FT when doing this in arbitration. I said, you know, people have this in their mind. It's just not in a database. This is the database they're using. There's more anecdote. There's so much anecdote in the field of law. And anecdata, as uh, Mark Lemley likes to call it, my anecdata, which is a, a story and an n equals one data point. And then people make these huge decisions. But there are papers. There is work being done, technical work to try to bring science to bear on these all over different topics. Good and choice of law, force majeure, court outcomes. And this is our paper, um, U.S. Supreme Court. And here's just a couple examples in the context of court administration. This is from Singapore, trying to help people simulate what would happen in their car accident case. Just everyday stuff. So they can decide what they want to do. And this is out of Canada. Out of China. So... In terms of law and computation, you know, the World Economic Forum calls, I want to talk about computation now, uh, the period we're moving into the fourth industrial revolution, what they mean by that is we're moving from this world of computerization automation to cyber physical systems. I personally call it the computational age because we're no longer like in the digital age, we're in the early computational age. And the kind of key ingredients of that computational age are, um, you know, one is I have this blog called Computational Legal Studies, so that's why I want to call it computational age, but here's some of the big components. AI, crypto infrastructure, not cryptocurrency, but crypto infrastructure and the internet of things. And it's the combinations of these ideas that unlock a lot of interesting kind of possibilities. You know, there's really, again, only two types of computers. There's this computer and there's this computer. And so what we use is models to do the computation, whether the model's instantiated here or instantiated there. And um, you know, in a sense, law and legal institutions are already computational. They're already computers. 
you could think of every individual or process as a form of computation. In fact, there's this kind of philosophical idea that the whole universe is a big computer. I'll send you over there for that. Okay. In a sense, it is. Now, outside of this context, you can think of, again, most legal institutions, there's rules and there's implementation protocols and so forth. And so, um, you know, guided by norms and rules, we're meant from, you know, the big idea in the computational age is reconsidering the role of human-centered expertise. I'm not in love with human decision-making because the science isn't that favorable to it. Everybody hates algorithmic judgment. I'm like, why do we love human decision-making so much? CEG, behavioral psychology, you see? It's more, we gotta be a little more even-handed about it. Everybody hates algorithmic decision-making, and that's fine. Then what's the alternative? The other computer, which we know has flaws in its operating system. Again, there's whole academic fields devoted to the flaws in this operating system. So a more measured or even-handed perspective, we think about what are the, the pros and cons of these particular things. But that's like a serious conversation, not a kind of like, you know, a caricature con conversation. Um, so what about implementing various rules? So I think this is the broad arc, broad arc here. The analog period, we see a lot of chaos and complexity. First thing you start seeing in digitization is people put process and predictability around things. But the computational age is about, can you really create, can you do create real value in reinvention? And so I just want to highlight a couple of examples uh, before I wrap up today. One from kind of the contract space and the compliance space. So on contracts and transactions. This is the contract life cycle. From I want a contract or request all the way through to a renewal and everything in between. Authoring, negotiation, approval, execution, obligations, management, compliance, renewals, and back again we go with the life cycle of a contract. So starting in the early contract life cycle, we have digitized contracts in the sense that they're born on computers, but you know, that's about it. You know, obviously in a commercial context, it's not a take it or leave it agreement. They're negotiated. And in fact, this is where they're typically negotiated, an MS word. What's the point of the negotiation? Transfer risks to the counterparty. Otherwise, I got some free legal advice. Sign every agreement and don't read it. Would that make me a good, some good legal advice? No, you probably don't want to do that in a, in a commercial kind. You might want to read it and decide. Um, and then mark something out and try to transfer some risk back to the other side. Yeah? There we use humans as the computers of legal risk. Many organizations, in fact, not wanting too much latitude in their decisioning, have created guardrails around this process. What have we created to aid people's computation? Well, if you go into a lot of our large organizations, they have contract playbooks. These are rules. A contract play playbook is a series of rules and data about, hey, you, this is how, what you are and are not allowed to do in negotiating an agreement with a counterparty. We're already putting rules and data around them. If they want this, say no. If they want this, give this fallback provision. We're already engaged in this exercise. Um, now, what if we wanted to implement a computational version of this idea? A computational version of this idea. Well, then you'd need data exhaust. What do the last 50 negotiations of this clause look like? What are they, where do they land? Now, a lot of that's stored in here is people's experience, but Sometimes it's, you know, that isn't always distributed across a large organization. Where's the data from this exhaust, this negotiation process? It's there. That's where we negotiate contracts is an MS word, typically, and email. So the frontier here is this. Can I build a system that for a while can negotiate with a counterparty? The answer is yes. Obviously yes today. How well can it do? What exceptions can it handle? That's the only question. Not, is it technically possible? It is technically possible. It already exists. Just how, how effective, how detailed, how can it climb the ladder? Now, we don't have to build a driverless car here. We can keep a lawyer in the cockpit. You'd be surprised how much of a markup you can see. Well, this is the last 50 markups. This is the, what they say. Here's going to be our follow-up. I'll just insert the, the fallback provision. And on and on it goes. It already is like a computer. This computer. It can be this computer too. So that's going to take you in this field, into this direction. These are the fields that are going to support that type of application. 
Okay, so we think about contracts. What are some of the examples of data in contracts? Well, there's words, clauses, definitions, parties, counterparties, third parties, geopolitical entities, other named entities. There's graph data. There's part, this term is defined in another part of the agreement. Now, obviously, contracts are more than just data. They specify higher order relationships between entities. They feature rules, data, references, computations, and obligations. Contracts want to be computer code so badly. They aren't, though. But they're already sort of partially computable. Let me just give you an example. Here's an agreement here, just a random agreement. It's a master service agreement, not the fanciest thing, not the least fancy. I want you to look at this and show you this is already a computation. This is the money. That's important. It's like how much you get paid. Fee amount, 10 million for first four quarters, 12 million for four quarters, then 15 million for thereafter. There's an obligation and a right there. But to calculate this, you need external and external internal data. So this wants to be code already. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, we have inflation now. Yeah, we didn't. Yeah, that was the good old days. But to calculate that, I actually need another piece of data to do the calculation. None of this is entailed explicitly. It's all implicit. Now remember, somebody has to actually extract that information and put it in the system, in a financial system, so this person is paid somehow, some way. So somebody already has to do a representation off this. You see how this is such a flat document that doesn't do what it could really do? It, they want to be computable. They want to push and pull data. Contracts do. The London Interbank offering rate and, it, and in the saga of, or, around this, a LIBOR manipulation scandal that made the rate go away, and all these financial instruments are tied to this thing. If contracts were structured data objects, then we would not need massive teams of lawyers to repaper all of these agreements. You'd just be able, you'd just be able to see it as a structured data object and swap it in for something else. So. All this work is actually being created because of the flatness in, the, in how impoverished a, a contract really is in the current representation. It's very expensive. So that's something I've worked on. Contracts are an analog object stored in a digital medium. Chaos and complexity is what we see here today. Now, there's this idea of law as code. It's a tricky and detailed subject. There's a theoretical version that Lessig started on 25 years ago. Um, and this. You know, there's also the idea of thinking about ideas from coding that could be useful for law. That's something we've worked on here. Um, then there's code as law. Code as law is the means to implement law. There have been various efforts over the years on this. Automatically embedding statutes has proven to be a very challenging exercise. But all, what I want to show you is organizations today have to ingest legal rules somehow, unless they're just totally rogue organizations. So they're already doing it. They're just The legacy approach looks like this. There's some change in a law or statute. It's reviewed by a lawyer who writes a memo. It's translated into a compliance policy and procedure manual somewhere that's then implemented through an Excel spreadsheet. That's it. You'd be surprised how much of the world is being held up by a pivot table in the back office somewhere. Is that, where does that fit in the theory of law? Law as Excel? When the execution layer for business was mostly not people in natural language, it's one thing. The misspecification is not so problematic. But here's a lightly digital version. Same thing, but the actual rule now is being then taken by a business analyst who's creating requirements to implement it in a system somewhere. And that is actually the law of record for practical purposes. That's actually the law. The law of the organization is now reflected in an IT system. But it's many steps removed from the underlying rule, and there's a lot of opportunities for a, loss, a translation loss in this. So one of the challenges we have where we kind of have this very humanistic style training of lawyers is they're not actually involved with implementing the law in reality. 
some IT person is doing the law, law implementation, and they're five steps removed from the process. We got to be at the table. But you got to have no, we, we have to have a different set of knowledge, you're going to be at the table. And that's just for one law or regulation at a given moment of time. Time doesn't stand still. We already talked about that. Things change. Law, the laws and rules change. So you got the whole cycle starts all over again. Each change in law regulation, the cycle starts anew. How would you even know there's a change in a regulation? That's actually hard for organizations, large-scale organizations, just to determine changes in law. This is called policy surveillance. That's a whole thing that people work on. You can do that analog, you know, like the 50 jurisdiction survey kind of thing. That's a classic first-year associate special right there. Yeah. So the last thing I want to talk about is this, you know, law and STEM. You know, I've long believed that a law, a law school and a technical school should meet. This is what it is. This is what it could be. I wrote a paper called the MIT School of Law, which imagine what a, what a world-class technical university who taught law would look like. That's my vision for this, but I think there's, what we see around the world is many schools starting to do something in this direction. It's a slow process. It's not, you know, it doesn't happen overnight, but you see more interest in these kind of ideas because I showed you what the challenges are. Got to bring the you got to bring the tools to the to the party that you know that are required. Um, so the other thing I'd just say is the demographic reality is we're about to have the largest generational transfer in human history, and that's a challenge to every organization. So we have all this expertise that's leaving. It's not reflected in any system, and it's gone out the door. So if you even believe in half of what I said today, um, we need better human capital, different human capital to support the trends highlighted in here, including helping solve the complexity challenge in law. We need more dis multidisciplinary individuals and more multidisciplinary teams. And that should be reflected in the content of legal education. Going from a world of I-shaped professionals to T-shaped professionals where you take your base legal knowledge and expand it with all these other things that actually al allow you to unlock the value of that education and solve the underlying problems that the world needs. So in this presentation, I've highlighted six forms of modeling that might be leveraged to better understand and hopefully improve the delivery of justice. I've identified various methods in intellectual fields um, whose work might be leveraged. Much more could be said in a longer form uh, session, but I think that at least helps map the intellectual terrain, at least in part. So, And hopefully will spur a series of uh, fruitful collaborations at the intersection of law and on and STEM. So I'm Dan Katz, Illinois Institute of Technology, Chicago Kent College of Law, Academic Director of Bucerius Center for Legal Technology and Data Science, and thank you very much for your, your time and attention tonight. <laughs>